Let's read our theme verse together. This is Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 17. Read this with me. For the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great, mighty, and awe-inspiring God, showing no partiality and taking no bribe. If you are just joining us this summer, we have been looking at the different names of God. We've looked at several of these so far. We've looked at Elohim. He is the mighty creator God. He is the one who set the worlds into motion. He created everything that is. He is also El Roi. He is the God who sees me. He sees us. He knows what we're going through. He is El Shaddai. He is the almighty God. He is all powerful. There is nothing beyond what he can do. He is also El Elyon. He is the most high God. Above all other so-called gods, he sits supreme as El Elyon. And then we looked at some of the, the names that are hyphenated with his proper name, Yahweh. Yahweh Jerai. God will see to it. God will provide. He knows our needs and he meets our needs. Last week we looked at Yahweh Nisi. God is my banner. And tonight, or today, not tonight, it's not nighttime yet, uh, but today we are going to look at another one of the Yahweh names for God. There's an old Christmas carol. Many of you will know it. It was written by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow in 1863. The American Civil War was being raged. Brothers were fighting against brothers. Our nation was being ripped apart at the seams. So Longfellow wrote a poem, and it, it wasn't a feel-good song. It was one of, of grief. See, Longfellow, his wife, had died in a, in a fire in 1860. And then on December 1st in 1863, the widower received some more tragic news that his eldest son, he was 19 years old, his name was Charlie, and he had been nearly paralyzed by a gunshot wound while he was fighting for the Union Army in the Civil War. And so he picked up his pen and he wrote these words. I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play, and wild and sweet, the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Then in another verse, he wrote this. And in despair, I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. How can we have peace when everything around us feels like it's falling apart, feels like it's broken? I know for many people right now, life is just hard. Life is just hard. Some of you have had things happen to you that you would have never planned have happened to you. Some of you have health issues. You don't make them public, but they're there and they worry you. They stress you out. Some of you might have surgeries pending. Financially, people are stressed out. That might be you. The credit cards are maxed. You don't know how you're going to pay the bills and financially you're just stressed out. Some of you have marital issues. Some of you have family issues. You don't want to talk about them. It's embarrassing, but you have them. Some of you have parenting issues. The children just aren't listening. They don't want to do what you're telling them to do, and they're, they're causing all kinds of problems and strife in the family. School just started back, right? You already can't wait for it to be over. Um, you know, everything is just demanding. Nothing is easy. Everything feels like it's a problem. It's like you're driving down the road in your car and all of a sudden all the lights on your dash just come on at one time and, and it feels like that. I mean, have you ever been there? Are, are you there right now? You see, the reality is this. Our hearts long for peace. Our hearts long for peace. We want peace in our lives. So here's the question. Are you looking for peace from the right source? The people of Israel, they wanted peace. You can open your Bibles this morning to Judges chapter 6. The people of Israel, they wanted peace. They were living in a time in Judges 6 where they were being greatly oppressed by a people group called the Midianites. They, they were in such a position that the people of Israel were hiding out in the mountains. They were hiding out in caves and, and strongholds. They didn't dare go into other areas. Because the Midianites, they were coming in and they would steal their harvests. And what they didn't steal, they would just destroy they had their livestock taken as well. All of this had happened because the Israelites had failed to obey their Lord God. But please don't make the mistake of thinking that every hardship that happens to you, everything that's difficult in your life, everything that you're facing is because you're in disobedience to God. Some hardships are caused because of things that we have done, but there are some hardships that we face that are outside of our control. In the case we're going to look at this morning, though, the people of Israel, 
This was caused by their own stubbornness and their own disobedience to God as a nation. But God is a gracious God, and he does for us what we cannot do for ourselves. So open your Bibles to Judges chapter 6. And in in Judges chapter 6, the the angel of Yahweh, most likely it's a pre-incarnation of Jesus Christ, he appeared to a man named Gideon. And Gideon was hiding out in a wine press, threshing his wheat. Look at verse 12. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, The Lord is with you, valiant warrior kind of amused by that address. I don't know if you are. If you know the story of, of Gideon, I'm kind of amused by the way that the, that, that the angel of Yahweh addresses Gideon. He called him a, a valiant warrior. <laughs> but as far as we know, Gideon was not a warrior. He, he Actually, in this passage, he's hiding. He's not fighting. He's hiding. And so look how Gideon responds to the angel of the Lord in verse 13. Gideon said to him, Please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, Why has all this happened? Have you ever wondered that? If if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened? And where are his wonders that our fathers told us about? They said, hadn't the Lord brought us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to Midian. Gideon actually takes his situation that they are in, and he blames God for it. He blames God for it. His knowledge of God is very, is very faulty. He, he treats God as if God exists to serve Israel, but he knows nothing of Israel's responsibility to worship God and to serve him. And sometimes I think we're guilty of doing the same thing. Our problems, many of them, are because of choices that we have made. And in anger, we blame God for the things that are happening to us. And we we treat God as if he's some sort of cosmic genie that is in a bottle and he just exists to serve us and to remedy all of our problems that have really been caused by our own disobedience. See, it's not that God moves away from us, but rather we move away from God. And so we need to move back to the place that God wants us to be. And so the angel of the Lord here just kind of ignores Gideon's blame game and he says this in verse 14. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in strength you, you have, go in the strength you have and deliver Israel from the grasp of Midian. I am sending you. But Gideon was having none of it. Look at verse 15. He said to him, Please, Lord, how can I deliver Israel? Look, my family is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the youngest in my father's family. Gideon tried to get out of the call by, by pointing to his weakness. God was actually providing the answer to their problems. But Gideon didn't want to do it. And I think, again, we tend to do the same thing. God says to us, hey, I've made a way for you. And we say, yeah, but I can't do that. I don't have the strength. And God says, yeah, yeah, but I have the solution for your problem. It's right here. And you say, yeah, but I don't really like that solution. You got another one? You know, and that's what we do. And verse 16 is so important. Look at what God says. He says, and don't underestimate these words. You'll see them throughout the scriptures. They are so very important. Look what he says. But I will be what? With you. I will be with you, the Lord said to him. You will strike Midian down as if it was one man. But I will be with you. You see, God knows you can't, but he can. God knows you are weak, but he is strong. God knows you can barely tread water, but underneath are the everlasting arms. God knows that you're full of anxiety and fear, but he cares for you. Don't worry about it. God will be with you. When you're doing what God wants you to do, he will be with you. When you're doing what God wants you to do, he will be with you. God will never call you to something that can't be done. God will never make a, a tell you to go in a way that, that can't be taken. God will never call you to do something that he can't do through you. God will be with you when you're doing what he's called you to do. But Gideon, he didn't understand this. He didn't understand who God is, and so this is what he said. Then he said, if I found favor with you, Give me a a sign. Give me a spine, maybe, right? But give me a sign that you're speaking with me. Again, we do this. We look for signs. When God's word 
tells us exactly what we need to do. We're out looking for signs, and God said, hey, I've already told you what it is I want you to do. We say this. We say, you ever heard this one? Well, I'll pray about it. I'll pray about it. You know, we get all spiritual about it. You know, I'll pray about it. God's already told you what he wants you to do. It's right here. God tells us what we're, what we're supposed to do, but we simply don't want to do it. And, and I want you to hear this. To ask for a sign when God's already revealed his will to you, it demonstrates an unwillingness to obey. That's what it demonstrates. Look at verse 18. This is Gideon speaking again. He says, Please do not leave this place until I return to you. Let me bring my gift and set it before you. And he said, I will stay until you return. So Gideon went and prepared a young goat and unleavened bread and from a half bushel of flour. He placed the, the meat in a basket and broth in a pot and he brought it out and offered it to him under the oak. The angel of God said to him, take the meat with the unleavened bread, put it on the stone and pour the broth on it. So he did that. The angel of the Lord extended the tip of the staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened bread. Fire came up from the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened bread. Then the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. Sounds like a very strange thing, but to really understand what Gideon is doing, we, we have to understand the ancient worship of false idols. Gideon was bringing food to the angel of Yahweh. He was bringing a gift, and what he was trying to do was obligate God to do what he wanted him to do. He was trying to say, look, I'm giving you a gift, I'm giving you a present, so now you have to do what I want you to do. He was trying to curry favor with this messenger of God by presenting him a suitable offering. But you see, Gideon still has no idea who he's talking to. How do I know this? Look in verse 22. When Gideon realized, all this time he's been having this conversation, he has no idea who he's talking to. When Gideon realized that he was the angel of the Lord, he said, Oh no, Lord God, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. I'm not going to go into great detail about this part in this message, but it is important to point out this. Gideon had been miseducated by tradition. The common thinking was this. If you saw a heavenly messenger, you're going to die. That was, the, that was the tradition. If you saw a heavenly messenger, you were going to die. The traditions had actually made people superstitious. And so I kind of thought about that. And you know what I realized? Sometimes our traditions make us superstitious as well. Sometimes our traditions, they misinform us about who God is, what he wants, what he doesn't like, things that can hurt us. And we, you know, we have all these superstitions that can really affect us in how we, we behave. We need to make sure that our understanding of God is, is not based necessarily on just traditions but based on his word. So God spoke to Gideon in verse 23. But the Lord, but Yahweh said to him, Peace to you. Don't be afraid, for you will not die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it, The Lord is Peace. And it's still in Ophrah of the Abyssalites today. God is Yahweh Shalom. God is Peace. God is peace. The word shalom, it actually means more than just simply peace as we think of it. More than just, just the absence of conflict. It was a greeting that was commonly used, and it's still used very commonly in, in Hebrew to this day. Shalom means this. It means peace. It means prosperity. It means welfare. It means your, your state of health, friendliness, deliverance, salvation. All of these words are tied up in this one word, Shalom. So when a Jewish person comes up and they say shalom to you, this is what they're saying. They're saying, may you be of good health. May you be prosperous. May you have a good state of welfare. Shalom is, is more than just that you know, peaceful, easy feeling when you're sitting on the dock of the bay watching the tide roll away. That's nice too. But shalom is so much more than that. Shalom is completeness. It is, it is wholeness. You see, Yahweh shalom makes your life whole. Yahweh Shalom makes your life whole. Say this, God makes my life whole. Say it, God makes my life whole. Now, now look at your neighbor and say, God makes your life whole. Say it, God makes your life whole. Yahweh Shalom makes your life whole. What does it mean to be made whole? Well, it means that you've been broken. That's what it means. It means something in your life is not quite right. I mean, it means that something is, is missing. Some people have described it this way. It's like there's a hole in your life that, that needs to be filled. You see, out, outside of Yahweh Shalom, there's no completeness. 
Some of you may be broken. You may be broken for many different reasons, but some of you are broken by your fears, by your anxieties, by your worries. So listen to what Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. He said this, Don't worry about anything, but in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And look at this. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. See, we as followers of Jesus, we're not to be anxious for anything. We're to take a request to God. He is Yahweh Shalom. And he gives us peace that transcends all understanding. And his peace actually guards our hearts and our minds. When we're, when we're not following God, maybe we're trying to do life on our own, we, we don't have peace because we're outside of his lordship. It's no wonder that we're anxious, but when we present our request to God and say, you know what? I can't do this anymore. You, you, it's, 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 not, it's not mine. I'm going I'm to give it to you. I, I trust you with it because you're in charge. You are Yahweh Shalom. You, you give us peace. You make us whole. Not only does Yahweh Shalom make our life whole, but he also makes our life sound. Yahweh Shalom makes your life sound. Say it. God makes my life sound. Say it. God makes my life sound. Now, we're going to do the same thing. Turn to your neighbor. God makes your life sound. Say it. God makes your life sound. Jesus told a story about a man who built his house on sand. It was in Matthew chapter 7, if you want to write it down and read it later. And many of you know it, though the waves and the wind came, and if you've ever built anything on sand, you know what happens. Um, building on sand is not generally a good idea, so when the, the waves and the winds came, the man's house just fell flat. He lost everything because his foundation for living was no good. But he also spoke about a man who built his house on a rock, on the rock. And the, the waves and the, the winds came, but this man's house stood. His foundation for living was sound. See, living according to the truth that's found in God's word is like building your life on the rock. Living your life according to any way else is like building your life on sand. We know this because our culture is constantly shifting. It's constantly moving. People are calling evil good and, and good evil. We don't build our life on the approval from people or how many thumbs ups or likes we get or whatever it might be, whatever our society deems as good. We build our life on the rock, on Yahweh Shalom. And when the winds of change come and the, and the waves of problems come and they hit you, you're going to be able to stand because your life is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and his righteousness. You're built on Jesus Christ, the solid rock of ages. And so Yahweh Shalom, his peace makes us whole. His, his peace makes us sound. But also this, Yahweh Shalom makes your life complete. God makes my life complete. Say it. God makes my life complete. You know what's coming next. Look at your neighbor and say, God makes your life complete. Look at these words of Jesus. They're found in John 15 and verse 5. He said this, I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit. Look at this last phrase. Because without me, because you can do nothing without me. Because you can do nothing without me. You can do nothing without Jesus. Without God, you are incomplete. It is only through Jesus that we prosper. If you cut a tree, uh, if you branch off a tree, you know what happens. It withers and it dies. And likewise, if you've not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then your life is incomplete. You won't have lasting peace. You always feel like there's something missing, something in your life that, that you can't fill. You have this God-sized hole in your life. And some of you know this because you're here right now and you're wondering, why don't, why don't I have peace? I'm trying to be a good person, but it's just not enough. You, you think maybe God is some sort of like cosmic Santa Claus who, if you're good enough, you know, he's going to bless you. But the reality is this. You can never be good enough. You can never be good enough on your own. You need Jesus. You need to believe in Jesus because here's what the Bible says. But now in Jesus, in Christ Jesus, 
You who were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Look at this verse 14. For he is our what? Peace. He is our peace. Who made both groups one and tore down the dividing wall of hostility in his flesh. Jesus Christ is our peace. Outside of Jesus, no promises. No promises. Inside of him, we can have a peace that passes all understanding. And you see, Longfellow knew this. He knew that God is Yahweh Shalom, and so he picked up his pen and he wrote another verse. He said this, Then pealed the bells more loud and deep. Look at this. God is not dead, nor does he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail, with peace on earth, goodwill to men. Do you have peace? Do you have peace? Do you have peace that only comes through knowing and trusting in Yahweh Shalom? You're in a storm, maybe you're in a storm, maybe you're in troubles and problems because of things that, that you've done. You've got yourself in a massive trouble. Your sin is catching up with you, perhaps. Maybe you've tried to change, but you can't. You can't be good on your own. It's in your very nature and your, your sin. It's what separates you from God. It's why you don't have peace. But the good news is this. The good news is this. God loves you so much that he sent Jesus into the world. And Jesus, who is God, took on flesh and became the perfect sacrifice for our sins. Jesus is the Lamb of God, who takes away the, the sins of the world. Jesus died for the forgiveness of your sins. And after three days in the grave, Jesus was raised from the dead to prove that everything he claimed was true. The Bible says this, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. One believes with the heart, resulting in righteousness. One confesses with the mouth, resulting in salvation. See, this morning, when you call on the name of Jesus, He will hear your prayer. He will forgive your sin, and He will make you new. And you will have peace. Peace with God. When you call on His name this morning, and receive the forgiveness that He offers, Please bow your heads and close your eyes.